so I, I really kind of focused hard on the coaching and, and, and at the time, you know, this is pre-internet, um, you know, in the kind of late 80s, early 90s, I, I started doing a lot of recruiting of, you know, because I knew so many Americans because they played over here and my family's connections and my, my younger sister, Jody played over here. And we just had so many different people that we knew. I was getting a lot of people calling me, asking me about, you know, getting Americans over to Australia to play. And at the same time, the whole kind of international recruiting thing was starting to take off. So I, I got heavily involved in, in that side of it um, where I was coaching in Australia. I coached, um, I coached at the sort of, you know, it's multiple incarnations of the league. It was the CBA and the state league and the ABA and all those kind of things. So I coached men's and women's teams at the Sunshine Coast on, in both at that level and was involved with some state squads and, and was coaching, you know, like elite junior teams on the Sunshine Coast and all that sort of stuff and worked for Basketball Queensland for a while and as a development officer on the Sunshine Coast and, and was doing the recruiting stuff. But I was doing it all um, to try to build up relationships and get myself in a position where I could get over to the States and coach because I kind of knew that, you know, as much as I love basketball in Australia, I think it's fantastic. We have great coaches and great players and, and all that. I mean, it's just so many more opportunities over here if you can get over here. It's difficult to do. Um, but, you know, with the networking and the relationships I built up over the years, I was able to get a, a job over here. Um, and um, that was 20 years ago. This will be the start of my 20th season as a college coach, um, my 15th as a head coach. And it was funny, though, because when I first came over here, I thought, oh, you know, I'll go over to the States for three or four years, a couple of years, whatever, and get enough experience that, you know, I can go back to Australia and work for Basketball Australia or one of the state bodies or whatever. But it just so happened I just kind of was able to, to get over here and, and kind of, you know, make a career out of it. And it's been really, really good for me. So um, this will be my 20th year. I, I spent my first four years as a Division One assistant. I was an assistant at Boise State University in Idaho. It was funny because I got there and um, I was there for a year. And, and uh, after my first year there, the head coach got fired and everyone got let go. So I thought that was going to be the end of my American experience. And that, that was after the Final Four. So we're talking, you know, March or whatever, April. My contract was good through June, so I stayed and I was able to, to get on at Troy State University in Alabama as an assistant. It's just, you know, kind of cool how things work out. The guy that had just got the job there, a guy named Mike Murphy, um, he, um, he had played in New Zealand after college. So he kind of, you know, this was like 2001, 2002. He saw the, you know, the opportunities to recruit, you know, the Southern Hemisphere, obviously Australia and that kind of stuff. So... I was there for four years and then I had an opportunity to take my first head coaching job in the States. And I sent out um, just a little bit of a quick bio. And uh, I went to a place called Brescia University in Owensboro, Kentucky. Um, and I was there for a couple of years and we did pretty well there. And then um, I got a, my next job was at a place called um, Newberry College, in Newberry, South Carolina. Uh, and you know, had a bit of success there and I was there 10 years. And then I've just taken a new situation here at Auburn University at Montgomery. So what I'd like to do is talk about those three particular programs and um, what I did there and how we did it and then kind of go through, I, I, I just call them talking points, but go through some of the, the things that I focus on, you know, when I go into to these programs and things that I feel are really, really important when you're trying to build a program and establish yourself. And I'm not, I don't really want to talk about the X's and O's so much today, it's more about the, just the relationship side and the building and the, you know, how you put a program together and those kind of things. Um, and I know it's still different for, for people in Australia because I know a lot of, a lot of the people down, you know, a lot of you guys are, um, you're working for a club or you're kind of doing development stuff. So it's a little different in terms of the, the building of a program because I'm just building a, a program around one team, whereas I know a lot of you guys coach multiple teams and, and all that sort of stuff. But a lot of the things are probably relevant to both and, and I'm happy to answer any questions, as I said, uh, you know, after, the, after I'm kind of done with the presentation. But... Um, so basically, as you can see there, the first head coaching job went to Brescia University in Owensboro, Kentucky. And the thing about that was a small independent uh, NAIA school. And um, the, the program had been really, really good. Two years before I got there, they went to the NAIA Division I Final Four. And the program had a lot of success. The coach left, they brought in a guy and he was there for two years. And the program took a dive. And the year before I got there, the team went 3-30. and 30. So I, I left an assistant coaching job at Troy State University and took that job on. And, um, you know, we, we went, uh, we won two conference championships there in my first two years and, um, and, and I went to a couple of national tournaments and a sweet 16 and, and, and had a lot of success there. Um, and 
the, the way we did it was, you know, the good old fashioned way of basically I, I was able to recruit good kids and, um, and then started from the ground up. And so if you look at, the, and when I finished going through the three schools, I'll talk about the, the talking points, which is kind of the way we operate all the time when we're building these things. So had a lot of success there. And then, so that was a tricky situation because I'd gone to a place where they won three games the previous year. And when you, when you go to a place like that, obviously the kids are a little bit downtrodden, you know, um, there's, there's not, there, you know, in, in some ways that's the best way to take over a program because you're able to, to have quick turnaround, you know, if, if you're able to bring the right kids in and if you're able to get the right message, get the kids to buy in, um, you know, and, and put whatever philosophy you're coaching in, into place. Um, so that was, a, that was a, my first head coaching job. And then the next place I went to was totally different because I went to a school that had actually, it was a division two school that had had a lot of success. Um, but they'd had a coaching issue, you know, and um, the, the coach had actually been fired for whatever reason. And I went into a situation there where the, the program was kind of in turmoil in terms of there was a lot of player, and I'm sure everyone that coaches knows this. I mean, there was a, there was a lot of player disharmony and kids trying to leave the team and, and all that kind of stuff. So that was a, a different scenario altogether, right? And then the last place... The, the, the most, and again, I was there 10 years and I built that thing and built it really on the back of Australian kids, to, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, when I, I was telling you earlier, when I, when I left there a couple of years ago, we had eight Australians on the roster. I had eight Australians, um, a kid from Macedonia and a kid from the UK and had a couple of American kids sprinkled in there just to make up the numbers, really. It was really, you know, built on the back of foreign kids, particularly Australians. And that, that's really, really helped me. Um, and we, were, we had a lot of success there. We were able to, you know, we had 10 straight winning seasons, won a championship, played for another one, a couple of national tournaments. Um, actually, you know, that program has the longest winning streak in the state of South Carolina for women's college basketball for, for consecutive winning seasons and still does. Um, and then the last program that I came to and that I'm currently in, and, and like I said, I was there 10 years, you know, and, and really had that program. You, you don't want to say on autopilot, but when you build a program like that, and, and it's more than building a team, it's building a program, the programs start to run themselves. Your players become your best recruiters. Your players become your best coaches because they're coaching up the other kids because they understand the philosophy, you know, and the way you want to play. Um, you know, your players become, you know, your leaders on not only on the basketball court, but in the classroom and in the community and, you know, on the campus community as well. So that was a great situation. And I, but I left that a couple of years ago to come here to Auburn University in Montgomery. And there's a lot of different reasons for it. Um, you know, um, a lot of it was the fact that I had ties to the state of Alabama. Uh, my wife's from Alabama. Uh, I met her when, when I was working at Troy State University as an assistant. She actually worked there as well. So her family's from here. So we had an opportunity to come back closer to home. And there was a lot of good things about the program here in terms of it's Auburn University. So you guys, I'm sure know Auburn, Auburn, Auburn with you know, Bruce Pearls, the coach on the men's side. Went to the final four, the last final four. Um, we're their Division Two school. So we're about 40 miles from the main campus. We're in Auburn, Montgomery. We have great facilities, great resources, you know, fantastic budgets. It's about 5,200 kids. It's a Division Two, but it's like a small B1. Um, you know, 3,000 seat arena, wellness center, which is state of the art, PE, you know, uh, sports sciences, kinesiology complex. And, you know, it's just a really, really good setup. So there's a bunch of different reasons for coming here, but, um, um, you know, the potential of the program was really what I was you know, looking at and the future and what we could do with it. Because, uh, and but the difference between this place and the previous two places was this place had been a powerhouse at the NAIA level during the late eighties through the nineties into the two thousands. They had 17 consecutive national tournament appearances, a couple of final fours, um, 13 conference championships during that time. But that was at the NAIA level. So, um, over the past three years, they've been transitioning to Division Two, and the program had really taken a hit for the last few years during the transition and slightly before it. So I was brought in here to, to take that, that program to the next level. And to be honest with you, you know, I had previously had, I think, about 12 or 13 years as a college head coach, never had a losing season, had a lot of success, and thought I was a super coach. And I'm like, yeah, I could turn that around in a day because I'd done that before and got here. And it's, it's been a really been a struggle for us. But we're in the process of getting that turned around. My first year here, we won five games. We were five and 23. Um, interesting scenario. I got here, I had 11 players on the roster. By the time we got to the season, we only had eight that could play. So 
We played the full season with eight kids. Um, I felt like I was coaching a Wednesday night game on the Sunshine Coast. One night we were playing a conference game. Had eight started the game with eight. Had four kids foul out, and we played the last two minutes with four players on the court in the college game. So, you know, it was a it was a tough season. And this last year we were able to bring in some kids, and you know, we won twelve games. And this next season, you know, we're going to be a lot better, I think, and have an opportunity to compete for a championship in probably the best Division Two conference in the country, which is the Gulf South. So if you look at those three programs that I've actually had an opportunity to take over, um, you know, you had, you had one that, you know, was an NAIA school that had had a lot of success and we were quickly able to turn that thing around. My first year at Brescia University, we went from three wins to 20 wins. So a 17 game win increase. It was actually the largest win increase in the country that year for college basketball, men or women, any level. You know, and then, you know, like I said, the next program I went to was a program that had had success on the floor, but was having a lot of internal issues. And, and that was a whole nother sort of, you know, challenge. And then this place has, has really been a transition from NAI to Division Two. Had a great school with great resources, great facilities and all that sort of stuff, but we probably didn't have the players we needed when we got here. Um, so with all those things, um, really what we're trying to do in all those different scenarios is look at the same things all the time uh, and focus on the same things. And again, we're not want to talk about X's and O's or how you want to coach and that kind of stuff because everyone's going to have their own philosophy. But I've kind of put down some, some sort of talking points here, which are really the things we kind of look at and that we're trying to work on as we, as we build or rebuild these programs. Um, the first one, the first question that you've always got to ask yourself when you do this stuff, when, and for anyone who's in coaching is why, why am I coaching? You know, why, why do I do this? Well, you know, and, and I think a lot of coaches probably forget to ask themselves that question, you know, and, and sometimes you really need to think, sit back and think, you know, why am I doing it? And hopefully you have the right answers, you know, and it, there's no right answer, but hopefully you know within yourself why you're doing it because if you don't really understand why you're doing it or have a love for doing it, it's hard to be great at it. And, you know, particularly, again, I know all coaches work hard, but for us, I've got one team to coach. It's a full-time job. Um, you know, and it's a 24 hour a day job, 365 days a year. Um, and you've got to be fully dedicated and, you know, you've got to be prepared to give up a lot of different things in terms of your family life and your spare time. And because you don't really have any, your life becomes devoted to that process of, of, of coaching college basketball. So that's the first thing we, you know, I, I, I say you've got to do, you've got to understand, you know, why you want to coach. And then the next thing I would say is you've got to know to, to yourself and you've got to be like, why do I want this job? You know, there's an old saying over here, you don't want your next job to be your last job um, because you take the wrong job and you end up in the wrong situation and, you know, you, you, don't, you don't do very well. Obviously, this is a results-oriented results business. You don't stay in the job long. So, you know, that's the, I think the thing that's really important is why do you want this job? You've got to look at the factors as to what makes this job appealing. Can you win there? Um, are you going to have the financial support you need, the resources you need to be successful and recruit and be able to attract good players and have the budgets that you need in order to, to travel all right and do the things you need to do well? And then you've got to make sure that it's, again, when you look at it from, from my standpoint, I'm a professional basketball coach, this is all I do. You know, um, for me to make a move to a school like the last move I made, is, is a lot of it is business related. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm 52 years old now. You know, um, to me, I've been coaching 10 years at the previous place. It was a small, small division two school, private school, um, where we had a lot of success and we would have kept having success. But to me, the move was, a lot of it was business. You know, this place has great potential. Um, obviously, they've been great before. But when you look at what, on the business side for me, gets me back into the Alabama retirement system. Um, which, you know, which over here is really, really good. I had four years in that when I was at Troy. And once you have 10 years in the Alabama retirement system, you're vested. So from a retirement standpoint, it's really good. And, um, you know, I have my budgets are way better. My facilities, my resources, everything is better. Um, so you look at it and you, you have to weigh up why do you want this job and can you win there? And, you know, will you be able to be successful? So, again, you've got to do the research and make sure you're going to the right places because you can be the best coach in America or Australia, or wherever you are, if you end up in the wrong situation, you're never going to have success. Um, and, there, and then obviously it's really important for any head coach or, or any coach, it doesn't matter if you're a head coach or a young coach or a coach coming through, you've got to develop a philosophy, right, of how you want the game to be played, you know, and, and how you want to coach the game. And, and it's a little, again, it's a little different for me um, 
because, I, I, and again, you know, I, I know, um, you know, in Australia, and then you're in your, whether it's New South Wales, Queensland, Vic, whatever, um, you know, everyone's coaching towards the, the, the state for, you know, the, the way that things we want to be done through our state programs. And obviously, you know, that filters into basketball Australia. So your philosophy is a little bit more dictated down there probably in terms of how you, you know, what style of basketball you want to play and that kind of stuff. But over here, um, you're really free to coach however you want to coach. So, but I, it's really, really important to have a philosophy, um, you know, and, and, and understand what that philosophy is and be able to make and be able to kind of communicate that and coach that philosophy and make sure that the game's being played the way you want the game to be played. Um, again, without talking too much about X's and O's, I mean, you know, you, but you've got to have it and you've got to know what it is and then you've got to stick to that because without having a philosophy and without knowing how you want the game to be played, it's very difficult to build a program because your program is built on those, that, that core philosophy. Um, um, you've got to have a mission statement, you know, you've got to have a mission statement as to, as to what you want, you know, how you want the program to be and how we're going to do it. Um, like any business, cause it really is a business. Um, and it's really important to then share that mission statement with your team. You know, you, your kids have got to know what, what, what you're trying, you know, what we want this thing to be like, you know, and how we want to get there and, and, and how we're going to achieve the goals that we've set. So, you know, that to me is really important. And that also feeds into some other, you know, like things like player buy-in, you know, because they understand the mission. And it's easy to get kids to play hard when they understand the mission and believe in the mission. Um, and then, uh, you, you know, you've got to make a plan, obviously. You've got to have a plan as to how you're going to attack it, how you're going to approach it. And on, a, on a daily basis in terms of, you know, you need to have your day planned out, you need to have your practice plan, all that sort of stuff. But you need to have a plan for like the, you know, when you get a job, um, you've, you've got to have a plan for the first seven days. You've got to have a plan for the first 30 days, the first 60 days and, and so on, you know, and, and, a, and a long-term plan for the program. But things like, you know, when you take the job, you know, what do you, you, know, you need to know, like in the first week, you've got to get certain things done. The first thing you've got to do is, is you've got to go in and recruit all the players that are already there. You know, and you hear a lot of coaches say, oh, well, you know, they're not my kids, they were there, you know. Well, that's really not true because it's actually the other way around because as a coach, you, you know the players in the program that are already in the program. You can look up the stats, you can watch them on Synergy, you can, you know, you know that. So when coaches say that, it's really not true. When coaches go, well, they're not my kids, they, they're not, they might not be your kids, but you had a choice as a coach to take that job. The players didn't have a choice in who was going to get the job, you know. Um, so the first thing you've got to do as a coach is, is, is you've got to go in and recruit the players, you know, and, and make sure that the kids that are going to be part of the program understand the things that we've talked about previously in terms of your philosophy and your, your mission and, and how we're going to achieve that thing. Um, you know, you need to, you know, in the, you know, obviously you need to, you know, when on a college campus, you need to make sure you're establishing relationships with the, obviously the administration, you need to be establishing relationships with the people around the program, the academic people, um, you know, sports information, all those kind of things, because you need to make sure that the program is starting off on the right foot and that, you know, you're actually building relationships instead of tearing down relationships. And, and when, you, when you come into a new program, there's always going to be something that's left over from the, from the previous program, whether that's people that love the old coach, people that didn't like the old coach, you know, we liked the playing style before. Your playing style is different. You know, there's a whole bunch of different things that, that come into that. And it's important that, you know, you're able to meet with people and talk about what you want to do, whether that's, you know, we call them boosters, you call them sponsors, um, you know, alumni, former players, all that kind of stuff. So you need to have a plan as to how, what you're going to do in the first seven days particularly, that's really, really important. And then you've got to continue to plan. And then you've got to report. You know, what, what I would, what I do is, is I'm always reporting back, especially early when you're establishing relationships with your athletic director, who is, who runs the athletic department, who ultimately hires you and fires you. You know, I'm always reporting back after a week, after two weeks, after a month, this is what we've done. This is what we're trying to do next week. You know, and, and that way, you know, you're keeping them informed as to what you're doing and they're seeing your successes and they are understanding what you're doing and, and how you're trying to make the program successful. So that's really important. And I'm trying to kind of rush through this because I know, you got, you know we, we've only got an hour, but because, um, you know, we could talk about these kind of things all day. Um, you know, 
The next one is what do you want your program to look like? You've got to know that. You can't just kind of go there and hope that it looks like you want it to look like. You've, you've got to know what, and, and these things are all related in terms of mission, philosophy, why you want the job, you know, what your plan is, and then ultimately that's, that's, going, to, that's going to determine what your team's going to look like. And, and it really, when you talk about today's athletes, and I hate it when people say, oh, millennials or whatever, generations Z or whatever they are, I don't know. I mean, they're just kids, you know. And, you know, the, the funny thing is people say kids have changed, you know. Kids have changed. Oh, you can't treat kids the same way. Kids haven't changed. Kids are exactly the same. Parents have changed, right? And, and their handlers have changed and their coaches, their AAU coaches and the people that, you know, handle them have changed. So, you, you know, you've, you've got to kind of figure out what you want your program to look like. And for me, it's we want to create a family environment. We want our program to be really, really competitive and we want to win basketball games. But we want our kids to be happy. You know, we want our kids to feel like they're comfortable and they're in a great environment. And, you know, to do that, you have to get your family involved. You know, to me, I'm in a, I'm in a family business. I'm working, you know, like I said earlier, it's a 24-hour day, 365 day a year thing. I mean, my family, I've got two older daughters that are in Australia, but come over here and stuff. And, and then I've also got two younger kids, seven and 12. And my kids are around the program. You know, my kids are around the program all the time. We pretty much, my family, my wife and kids, they meet almost every recruit we have. You know, when our kids come on campus to recruiting visits or whatever, we go out to dinner and my family comes because it's really, really important that we establish that, you know. Your, your kids are usually a good judge of character too, um, you know, and they can probably tell you something about a kid sometimes, but it's, um, it's really important that you establish that, that you're, you're trying to create a family environment. You know, and that, you, that you're, you're trying to put them in a position where they can not only be successful academically and athletically, but they're going to be comfortable and they're going to be looked after. Um, and that's really, really important for us. So that's, that's, a, that's a big thing. Um, and, you know, I, people say it all the time. I try not to use this terminology, but, you know, creating a culture. I, 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 I don't like that. You know, I'm Australian. You've all seen um, the movie The Castle, right? Everyone's seen The Castle? You know, classic Aussie movie. We're trying to create a vibe. It's a vibe. You know, it's 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 not a. You know, to me, it's about creating that vibe. You know, around your team. That that's that feeling of of we're happy and we're enjoying it and we're here together and we're in this together. So you know, I I try not to say, oh, we're creating a culture, changing a culture. Da 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 da. I mean, sometimes the culture's not wrong. It's just not the right vibe there. You know, and I think that's really really important. And we stress that and we work on that and it's not hard it's, excuse me it's not easy because you know when you when you're in this situation you're dealing with kids you know from you know multi multiple different backgrounds whether that's religious political from a different country you know socioeconomic you know what i mean there's a lot of different things that, that you're dealing with and you know it's 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 not easy, but you know, when you create that vibe and that inclusiveness and kids know they're respected, I mean, that really, really helps you to have a successful program. And that's an everyday thing. That just doesn't, you know, that's not just the start of the year. You can't just be like, Hey, let's all sit around the campfire and sing Kumbaya on the first night, man. It's, it's every day. You know, you're working at that every single day because without that, it's very, very difficult to win basketball games let alone have it. You can't have a successful team, let alone build a program. Um, so I think that's really, really important. Um, you know, and probably in a lot of respects, the next point that I have on here is probably the most important thing. And that's recruiting because it's, it's hard to win if you don't have the players, you know? Um, but then it's hard to win if you have the wrong players. So recruiting is really, really probably, well, it, it, it's undoubtedly, recruiting is 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 what we build our careers on you know without players it's hard for us to win games if we don't win games we get fired it's simple as that you know you can people talk about academics and you've got to have a gpa and you've got to do this and you've got to do that right and my kid and i'm proud of what we do academically you know i've at, when i was at newberry my team one year won the championship and won the conference gpa award we won the conference GPA award multiple times. This year, I had 14 kids on my roster. Ten of them were in the all-conference um, academic team, you know, all-conference team. We had, you know, so we four, 10 of our 14 kids were honoured by the conference for, for their academic achievements. At the end of the day, if I don't win enough games, they're not going to keep me around because the GPA was good. 
You know, at the end of the day, they're going to keep me around if, if we win enough. And the program does what it's supposed to do on the basketball court. So, you know, it, it's hard to win if you don't create that right environment and that right vibe and have kids feel like, you know, they're comfortable and, and they, can, they can be successful. Um, and then re recruiting, you know, you've got to recruit the right kind of kids. You, first of all, you've got to recruit kids that are, that are academically qualified. You know, you, you've also got to recruit kids that are going to do the right thing. You know, and if you look at, you know, especially when you start a new program, um, you, know, or, you know, for example, with us now here at AUM, my first year when I got here, we had 11 kids on the roster, like I said earlier. We had eight kids that were eligible to play by the time the season started. I didn't take the job until August, all right? So I took my first day, it was the first day, of, my first day on the job was the first day of school, the 20th of August. I, I didn't get to recruit anybody. So, you know, we had those kids and we played with those kids. Um, but then what we were able to do the next year was bring in like four new players and we went from five wins to 12 wins. You know, this last, this, this last year we're bringing in another five kids and I have no doubt that, that, um, that we'll win more games and be successful. Uh, but what's really important for me as a coach in this situation, especially as we've transitioned from NAI to Division Two, I need to get a better quality athlete, a better quality player, but I've also got to get kids that understand what the mission is, what my philosophy is, why we're doing it, and kids that want to be part of building something. You know, kids that are going to help me set a standard because basically, you know, the kids that I recruit in these first two or three classes are the kids that are going to set a standard for how we want the program to look going forward. And again, not just basketball-wise, but from, from you know, we, we want to be great in everything. We want to be great in the classroom. We want to be great in the weight room. We want to be great, you know, obviously playing basketball. We want to be great in the community, doing community service. We want to be great walking across campus. We want to be great in the cafeteria. You know what I mean? Like, but that takes a certain kind of kid, you know? And, and again, as a coach, it's something that, you know, you've got to start hopefully getting the right kid. And recruiting is not a science, you know, recruiting is not a science, it's subjective. And, you know, I've, I've had a lot of success. I've recruited a lot of great players. I've coached five, I think six All-Americans now. Um, and four of those, three of those kids are Australians, by the way. Um, but sometimes you get it wrong, you know. You know, as much as I've loved the Aussie kids, I've coached some Aussie kids that should not have been there. And, you know, that's on the coach, by the way, too. It's funny, though, because you see a lot of it, you know, coaches will tend to fire kids. You know, oh, this kid's no good, she's no good, he's no good, whatever, and they'll get rid of a kid. Well, shit, you recruited her. You recruited him. You evaluated her. Sometimes we just get it wrong, you know. So uh, recruiting is really the lifeblood of coaching, and, and it's what, you know, in, in order to stay in a job, you've got to be a good recruiter. Um, but, again, all the things that I talked about previously, that all kind of fill, fills into your recruiting because you've got to, you know, recruit kids that, that fit the style of play you want to have, your philosophy, you know, kids that understand what you're trying to do, all those kind of things. So you know, all that stuff's kind of interconnected. Um, the next one I've got there is, you know, you need to establish from, from day one, and, it, and it's an everyday thing, what your, what your core values are and what your standards are. You know, we call them, we, we have um, not negotiables. You know, we have certain things in our program that are not negotiable. Being early, going to class, you know, making sure that you're doing your extra work, you know, making sure that you get your lifts in, making sure you're doing there's, there's certain, and, and again, as a coach, you can develop that list yourself, but you've got to have it. You know, you've got to have a list of what your non-negotiables are, things that you just, that this, they just have to be that way if you want to be successful. That's going to be different for everybody, you know. Um, and like I said, you want to make sure they understand what the standard is because the kids are setting the standard. The players are setting the standard, you know. The players are setting that standard. And, and it's, it's like anything. If you don't know what the standard is, it's, it's hard to, to, to follow that standard or to live up to that standard. So, again, that all kind of comes into, like we talked about before, making sure that you're communicating these things with your players. Um, I've, the, I've, the, two could, the next two could go together, and that is I've got um, develop buy-in and ownership from your players right, and develop buy-in and ownership from your parents. And I'll talk about parents first um, because I know you guys in Australia have this problem and it's not just a club basketball thing. It's not an under-12 thing. You know, it's, it's, it's all the way through to the highest level of basketball. And we can talk, look, at, look at the balls, for example. 
It doesn't matter whether you're playing in the NBA, WNBA, playing in the SEC, playing Division Two, playing at a junior college, high school, junior high, whatever. The, the parents are more involved today than they've ever been. You know, and like I said before, really the kids haven't changed a whole lot. Parents have. Parents have changed a bunch. So you've got to figure out a way that you can, because you know, ultimately too, with, with recruiting, like you've got to sell the parent as much as you've got to sell the kid. You know, because you know, mum or grandma, whoever it is that's in charge, that's making the decision, dad, whatever, or sometimes it's the AAU coach or the you know the, the handle of the club coach, whatever it might be. I mean, you've got to sell those guys on the on the program and your vision and your philosophy as well. So again, it's really important that you have those other things in place in order to be able to sell your program to not only the players, but the players' parents or the player, the people around the players that help that kid make decisions. Um, and then, you know, you, you know, I hate to say it, but just like everywhere else in the world, you know, even at this level, you're going to have a disgruntled parent. And most of the time it's over playing time. I think you all probably know that. <laughs> most of the time it's over playing time. And you'll get that. But, you know, if your parents, the parents of your kids and the kids in your program understand that what we're doing and how we're doing it and they're bought in, they understand that they, you know, they, they understand your philosophy and they see your vision and they know where you're going. For the most part, you're able to work with them. You know, you're able to, because they get it. It's when people don't know what you're trying to achieve or how you're trying to achieve it that they become frustrated and, and disheartened because they're not getting the reps or the opportunities they think they should be getting or they think their kids should be getting. You know, so involvement is really, really important. We do a lot of things with our parents. So we include our parents. You know, we, we have a lot of functions after games on weekends or whatever. You know, we have parents' nights and we do stuff where you know, we want them to be involved because we want parents to take ownership of the program as well. You know, we want parents to be proud of what they're doing and proud of the program. And that really, really helps. So that's, that's super important. And again, that's a difficult thing at any level, at any level of basketball, male or female, it doesn't matter. I mean, people are going to be involved and you've got to make sure you can work with them. Um, player buy-in and ownership. You know, buy-in is one thing, but then having, them, having the players feel like it's their program is really, really important. And, you know, the way we try to achieve that is just to try to build relationships, you know, and try to see kids. Obviously, we're monitoring their academics and doing all that sort of stuff, but, you know, you've got to know these kids a little bit off the court as well. You've got to be having conversations with them, not about basketball, but about, how things are, you know, you need to know a little bit about the home life and what's going on and, and, and that kind of stuff. Cause again, it's different for everyone. Um, you know, you, you've, you've got to, and again, if they understand the vision, you know, and the mission, you know, the, and, and why you are doing it. And if they understand why I coach and why I love it, and then I can understand why they're doing it. It's a much more cohesive relationship and people are going to tend to want to work with each other. But then we do a lot of things too, but we, we want the kids to have ownership of the program. And I tell the kids all the time, I'm just a coach. This is your, this is your team. You know, you're part of a program, but this is yours, you know, and, and, and you need to let them make decisions. I heard Bobby Knight talking about this one time. It was a long time ago. Not that long ago, a few years back. Bobby Knight was talking about how he would let his kids, and I do this, you know, you let them make decisions. For example, if, you know, we got to eat pre-game meal. All right, and we got three restaurants. Bang, bang, bang. Where do you want to go? They decide. You know, just things like that. You know, we we tomorrow morning we're on the road or whatever. We got to shoot around. We can either have a shoot around at nine or ten. What time do you guys want? Ten. Okay, we'll shoot around at ten. You know, let them take ownership of the program. Let them take make decisions. You know, if it's not important, <laughs> you know what I mean. If it's a decision that they can make, I'll let them make it. You know, again, even as a coach, in the heat of the moment, you know, they know better than us sometimes. All the time, in timeouts, you know, I'll, I'll go to a timeout and I'll be like, hey, you know, what do we want? What do we need to run here? What do you guys want to run here? Sometimes I'll be like, no, nah, that's not going to, no. But a lot of times I'll be like, yeah, okay. And if it doesn't work, then I can blame them, right? No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, we, it's, it, it, you know what I mean, though? But you, you let them, you know, have decisions. Let them be part of the decision-making process. You know, we, we, let, we let our kids, we come and show them the catalogue. What shoes do you want? Hey, we're going to get this stuff. What let them pick, you know, some things. Let them take ownership in the program. And, again, that just creates that vibe of, you know, we're part of this. We're in this together. We're doing this together. And kids are going to be more inclined to play hard for you you know, and be committed to the program and each other if they feel like it's theirs 
that, you know, they're not just in sort of some situation where they've got some guy running around screaming at them and telling them what to do all the time. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm the boss and it's my program. And ultimately, at the end of the day, I make the decisions and the buck stops with me. And if the thing doesn't go bad, doesn't go well, sorry, you know, I get fired, you know, and, and I understand that. But I can't do it without the players. You know, I can't do it without the players. I can't do it without the parents, you know. So um, the next thing I've got on that list is make sure you find mentors or a mentor that you can talk to and get honest feedback from and get, you know, someone that, that knows you and knows you, what you're doing, and, but someone that you can talk to, you know, that's going to give you honest feedback and, and advice and, and those kind of things. I'm a big believer in, I can't remember who told me this, but I heard this a long time ago, you're only as smart as the information you have access to. So, you know, the, the more people you surround yourself with that know more than you, the better you are. You know, the better you are. Um, you know, and the more people you have around you that will give you honest advice and help you. And that doesn't mean you always have to take advice, you know. And I know sometimes as coaches, you know, someone will tell us something. You know, even my assistants, you know, they'll, they'll say something to me and I'll be like, no, nah, no, nah, that's a bad idea. And two days later, I'll suggest it. It's actually a good idea then. You know what I mean? I mean, so you, you always want to have people around you that, that, that you can bounce stuff off, that you, can, that you can use as a resource that are going to be honest with you. Because without that, you know, it, it's hard. You know, I, I hate using cliches. I'm going to use another one. You don't know what you don't know. You know, you just don't know what you don't know until someone else tells you, you know. So get with people that can help you and be honest with you and, and, and give you good advice. Um, the next one I've got is... Um, Oh, I went a bit out of order. So communicate with your administration. And, you know, you obviously when you get the job, you, you go in, you interview, you, you know, again, you know, in Australia, it's, you know, whether you're working for a club or you're just working, you know, for an association or a state body or whatever it is, you, you've got to be able to communicate with the people that are responsible for keeping you in a job, hiring you, paying you, you know, that have given you a set of expectations as to how they want the program to, 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 to do. You've usually got some kind of staff evaluation that has to happen and certain things you have to hit in order to get a bonus or to, to get an extension or whatever. So, and it's like I said before, when you do your plans, you know, when you do your plan, when you, when you make your plan and you have your seven day, 30 day, 60 day, you need to be, you know, doing a report, written report and getting that back to your administrator, your administrators, your administration. You know, and, and, and I know sometimes as coaches, especially at this level, you know, you see the AD walk into the gym during practice, you're like, oh, shit, this can't be good. Why are they in here? You know, but to me, you, I, I, we want our administrators, and our, my bosses to be involved in the program. We want them to, to love it and understand it. And again, you know, that's a, a lot of that's about communication. But the better relationships you have with your administrators, the more chance you've got to get in stuff done you know and and they understand what you're trying to achieve if you know when you're going for your interview they probably ask you what your core philosophy is or how you're going to play whatever but i mean you need to be constantly telling them what you're doing and how you how you're trying to achieve that you know so i think that's really really important um you know i was i've, I've, worked, I've had three head coaching positions over here and i think i've worked for 12 ad's you know the first two jobs i had after the first year the ad went you know um, you know, at, at Brescia, I was there for a year. AD took another job, bang. So now you're working for another guy. So you got to start all over again. You know, I went to Newberry College after first 12 months. The AD that hired me took another job, bang, another AD. Now I've got to go and reestablish myself with that particular person. Now, this guy didn't hire you. That's the other thing. It's okay when you're working for the guy that hired you, but then all of a sudden some guy comes in. This is a lot of coaches lose their jobs after an athletic director change because. Yeah, that guy brings in, you know, really he's got his own way of doing things. So it's important that you're continually working with and, and, and communicating with your administration. I'm really lucky where I am now. I work for an athletic director who's, she's a female, first female AD I've worked for. She's um, in her late 30s, so she's young from, for the profession. But she's the best AD I've ever, I've ever worked for. And um, that's really, really important. Uh, and that, some of that relates back to the, why do you want this job? you need to know who you're going to go work for because some people are hard to work for, you know, and, and all that comes down to a little bit in, of investigation, you know, before you take the job or before you apply or interview. So um, develop youth camps. That's really big for us. You know, we, we really want to, to be doing clinics and having camps. We use it for recruiting. Obviously we can make money out of it as well. We're, 
no camps this year because the NCAA shut us down until the end of July. But normally we do team camps where we have teams come in and they'll play for three or four days and you can obviously recruit. And, you, you know, you're getting exposure for your program. You know, we have individual camps where we have, you know, we invite kids in elite camps, you have little kid camps, do all that sort of stuff. So establishing those youth programs is really, really important for your program in terms of just getting it in the public eye, establishing contacts. It helps you to meet high school coaches and AAU coaches and, and other people as well. So, you know, that's really, really important. Um, and I'm, I know it is at the club level too in Australia when you're you know, doing your camps and stuff. Um, you know, um, establish relationships with alumni and boosters. And I mentioned that. That's got to be in your first seven days. You know, you know, everywhere I've been, the first thing we do is, one of the first things we do as soon as we can get it organised is we'll have some kind of reunion. You know, and it's the same in Australia. My dad, um, you know, ran basketball up on Sunshine Coast for like, you know, almost 40 years. You know, he was the first guy to coach it at the... You know, we got, you know, 1986, we started in the state league up there, you know, and, and my dad's gone back through and I kind of probably got this a little bit from him, but, you know, he, we, we were running, he was running that place, doing all, getting all the sponsors and doing all that sort of stuff. But you now he's gone back and he's, you know, every single player that's ever played for that club, you know, they're numbered, kind of like the Australian cricket team does, you know, number one through, they all get a cap with a number on it, you know, and, and, you know, that I think is really, really important. And we do that here and we're, we're, we want to make sure that we're getting in contact and, and recreating and re-establishing those contacts with your, we call them alumni, but your former players and stuff. I think it's the same in Australia. That's really important. And then that you're, you're establishing and, and making connections and contacts with, we call them boosters, but you would probably call them sponsors, people that are going to help fund your program, people that are going to pay for a new locker room, people that are going to put a big screen TV in your locker room or, you know, even to the point where people are going to pay for, for meals for your team over the Christmas break or, or those kind of things, you know? Um, so that's really important because, you know, even I know it at, in Australia at the club level, it's important, but here at the college level and even at the highest level over here, you know, even if you're playing at Duke, I mean, you know, it's, it's a lot of it's built on, on fundraising money and that money comes from boosters. So you've got to be, you know, accessible and open and you've got to be able to listen to some guy tell you about how you should play and, what you're doing wrong and, and all those kind of things. But, you know, you've got to kind of do that sometimes in order to make sure that you keep the people happy and you're going to maybe get that sponsorship or you're going to get that, that check, you know, that's going to help you move your program forward. Um, you know, uh, the next thing I've got on here is um, um, build relationships with your sports. And we, we have a, every university has a uh, sports information department, you know, that, that handle all your kind of your marketing and your, you know, your PR and your websites and do all that sort of stuff. You know, you've got to build relationships with those guys and you've got to build relationships with your local media. You know, you've, you've got to be, you've got to know who the guy from the local paper is, the local TV station, the local radio, um, because, you know, you need that tool to make sure you're promoting your program to make sure that you're getting, you know, your program. And that all ties back into recruiting and, and all those kind of things, you know, fundraising and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, making sure that you're establishing relationships with your local media and the people that can help promote your program in the broader community is really, really important. Um, uh, establish a great community service program. When you're trying to build a program, you know, you can't do that on your campus. You know, you have to get off your campus. You have to take your players out into the community and doing things like, you know, we call, there's a thing here, Habitat for Humanity, for Humanity, where kids build houses, help build houses, or you're going into schools and you're reading or you're doing a walk for the, you know, the Mental Illness Association or you're delivering meals or helping get meals ready for Meals on Wheels. And we've done all these things just this year, you know, because not only do you want to help promote your program, but you want to do good for people while you're in this position. We tell our kids all the time, you know, as a student athlete, this is the most, the, 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 the best opportunity you're ever going to have in your life to impact other people is now as a student athlete, because you can go into a school. And I remember when I was a kid in Australia, you know, the first American I, I, I talked about already, I remember seeing Gail Henderson play when I was, you know, a young, you know, young teenager and she was playing in Brizzy, playing for Australia and all that, you know, and I still remember that. You know, I remember when Brian Banks, I don't know if any of you guys remember Brian Banks, when the Bullets played in red and white, came and, you know, we didn't even have a bloody stadium in Richard. We played on the outdoor courts until I was 15, 16 years old. I remember Brian Banks came to Maroochydore when I was probably 10 or 12 years old, and I'll never forget it, because Brian Banks paid some attention to me, said, hey, you know, 
you're good at this, you're good at that. And, you know, those kind of things really impact kids. So we tell our kids all the time, you've got the opportunity to go out into the campus, you know, into the broader community, get into schools. Sometimes you go into these schools where you know, some of these kids, they haven't got much at home. You know, they, they might not ever have anyone in their family that's graduated from high school, let alone go to college. And, and you've got a chance to go out and maybe change one kid, you know, by, by saying, hey, I could be like that guy or I could be like that girl. And, you know, I tell my kids all the time, even if you get to go play professionally, you go overseas, you go to Europe or wherever, you go back to Australia, wherever it might be, you're never going to be able to have the same impact that you have as a student athlete. Building and part, that's a huge part of building a program is building that program off campus as well as on campus. And I know, I know, I don't know, it's a little bit different in the club situation in Australia, but I know there are often community service opportunities where, you know, as a club or as a, as a team or as an organisation, you can go out and help people, but that also helps you in, in turn. And just doing it is a great thing. Um, and then the last thing I've got on here is keep evolving. You've got to continue to evolve. The way I coach now, the way I talk to players, the way I communicate now is different to when I was in Australia coaching. It's different to, 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 to five, 10 years ago. It's different to five years ago. You know, and, and, and my core values haven't changed. We're playing the same way. My, the, the way I want my team to look is the same. But you have to evolve as a coach with the community that you're in, where you are. You know, you've got to evolve in order to communicate better. You've got to evolve. And some, you know, and while you may have the same core philosophies as a basketball coach, and those things will never change, your core is never going to change, you've also got to look at the game changing. You know, the way we played five years ago, 10 years ago, is not the same way we play now. That's at every level. You know, we used to be where you'd want to dribble the ball down the court, you know, if you didn't get a fast break, and then you'd wait and you'd, you'd get to your post and you'd want to throw the ball into your post and the post player turn around and try to score from close. You know, that's now we figured out, the analytics will tell us, that's not the best shot. You know, the best shot is the corner three when you want to work it out on production of points and all those kind of things. You know, everyone's, the game's changed. You know, well, don't get me wrong, we still want to have it. Gail Henderson, we still want to have a great post player in there. So that, that, that's, that's, that's the way, it's, that's never going to change. But the, the way the game is, is played now is different. You know, it's a lot more positionless. The advantage I probably have over a lot of American coaches coming from an international background, we've been like that longer, you know. So, you know, I tend to coach. They, the way I coach over here, people call it the international style because we're a lot more spread out and doing all that kind of stuff. But the game has changed. So you've got to continue to evolve. And then the last thing I've got in there is remember that you're not building a team, you're building a program, you know. So, you know, I was 5 and 23 in my first year, 12 and 16 last year. And that sucks because they were the first two losing seasons I'd had as a, as a college coach. And that 5 and 23 year, man, I'm telling you, if I had it, I don't have a dog, but if I had one, I would have kicked it every night I came home. It's, it's not easy to go, to go 5 and 23 when you're used to having success. But you've got to understand the way you do things is right. You've got a blueprint. The blueprint you have works, you know that, all right? And now you've got to build the program. And, and, you know, again, like I said, we'll be a lot better this year and in two years' time, we'll be even better. And, in, you know, in five to six to seven years' time, we'll be, um, you know, we'll be one of the best teams in our conference and we'll be competing for conference, regional and, and national tournaments. So, you know, it's, you've, you've got to remember that. It's a process. I hate that's a kind of a cliche too thing, you know, the 76ers. It's a process, but what you've got to understand is every coach is going to have a different process and every process is going to take a little bit, of, is going to be different. So 